Well, growing up, I was uh, I was not that athletic, and uh, I had a speech impediment. So to be a uh, person that was not athletic, having a speech impediment, I had a lot of kids that made fun of me. Uh, you know, I had a lot of teachers that didn't take the time out to uh, help me to overcome my shortcomings. So I had uh, parents that uh, told me, you're not going to use that as, that as an excuse. You're not going to use that as an excuse to uh, at least try hard and to get good grades or to do whatever. You know, you're just going to have to work on your own. And, you know, I, I sit in the mirror day after day, uh, you know, night after night saying she sells seashells by the seashore and, you know, all those tongue twisters and this and that. And I overcame the speech impediment. And, uh, you know, when I became valedictorian in my class my senior year, all those teachers that didn't want to take the time out to uh, help me out then decided they wanted to take the credit for it. But, uh, you know, I had uh, loving parents that uh, no matter what, they were not going to let me use excuses for anything. And, you know, not being able to score touchdowns, you know, people are not going to be your friend. Not being able to run or shoot a basket, people are not going to be your friend. So I had a coach that said, Hershey, if you believe in yourself, you know, you go out and uh, work hard, you know, do some push-ups, sit-ups, and this and that. And I started doing those things, and I saw results from it. And when I started to develop uh, my athletic ability, you know, I didn't care what people thought about me. You know, I was, I was just going to do it. Whether they thought I was doing something good or bad, I felt good about what I was doing, and I did it. I graduated high school as a, a beta club president, which is a club that you have, a, have to have an A to be a part of. I was president of the Beta Club. I uh, went into college with a very high uh, grade point average because I knew the work ethics that it took. I knew that as long as you apply yourself, from what, from what my parents have told me, as long as you apply yourself, you're going to succeed. You know, too many people today are afraid to step up at bat. And they're afraid that life is going to throw them all kind of curveballs and this and that. And you know what is so strange is there's no one in professional baseball that is batting 100. I doubt there's anyone batting 600. There's no one probably not even batting 500. But as long as you're not afraid in life to step up and take on a challenge, you never know what's going to happen. And every challenge that I've been faced, I'm going to step up and swing. Because one time I may hit a home run, and that home run is going to carry me a little bit farther. You know, and that's what is so great to me about the academy here is that, uh, you know, I, I won so many awards in my life. I won a lot of things, but I remember uh, when I got the word about coming up here to the academy as a student, and, uh, you know, I was getting so many scholarships offers, and I really didn't know what to think of it until I got here and saw the other students here. And it made me proud to be a part of that. There was a high school coach that believed in me. His name was Tom Jordan. And it was funny, I had two older brothers who uh, was very athletic. And when Coach Jordan saw me and how clumsy and uh, you know, I couldn't run, couldn't do anything. He just said to himself, you know, if his two brothers are great at sports, Hersher got to have something. He's got to be good at something. So he used to go come pick me up after Sunday school, after church, and on Saturdays, and make me go out to this track. And he'd work out with me, he played with me, and he made me feel good about myself. And he said, okay, you're going to do your homework here. You've got to do this here. And that, he was just like my, my parents. And he believed in me. And uh, he's, he, you know, he the teacher that, uh, you know, and they say, what teacher you have? And I say, a coach. And most people say, oh, geez, that's just sports. But that's not. It's, it's that he was someone that was the role model, was the teacher in my life. He always wanted a bass boat. And uh, he's a big fisherman. It's funny because, you know, uh, he always wanted a bass boat. And growing up in Wrightsville, Georgia, you know, I don't have any money. I can barely rub two nickels together. And then uh, becoming a professional foot, a football player, I got him a bass boat. And, you know, that's, and I love that because, you know, for what he did for me, he put me in the position I'm in right now, you know, a bass boat isn't enough. You know, he's, uh, he means a great deal to me.
My parents didn't have a lot of money. My high school didn't have a lot of money to afford a lot of the expensive weights and, you know, all this stuff. And I uh, didn't use that as an excuse. I started doing push-ups and sit-ups during, com during commercials as, as I was watching TV and started doing about, you know, sometimes 2,000 push-ups, 3,000 sit-ups, uh, 1,500 pull-ups, uh, dips or, you know, 1,000 dips and, you know, different things like that. And I started creating different hand positions for all that. And then I learned that that can work you out. And in the olden days, that's what people used to do. I think now people sit around, now you have this guy sitting around saying, well, let me create this machine that will work this muscle here of someone and I can make a billion dollars. But yet he don't even use the machine. But he want to create it so he can make money off of it. But I'm doing it to work myself. You know, I have a lot of people that now, you know, always write to me or people that saying, Hersh, why don't you come train me? I pay you this, I pay you that. And I say, you know, it's funny because I'm different. Not different, whereas your body is different from my body. This may work good for you and not work good for me. It may work good for me and not so good for you. So for me to say I'm a trainer, I first got to know you. I got to know what your body is. You know, I just can't just say this is going to be great for you. But I can say it will help you a little bit. But that may be another thing that you need to do that'll be a little bit better. My sister, she was uh she's a year, a little bit over a year older. And she was fast and you know, like I was that chubby kid and she was always beat me. She always beat me and, and I just felt that, you know, I couldn't see a girl beating me all the time. And I said, I gotta beat her, I gotta beat her. And I just trained and trained, and you know, every time I went up to a uh, race, she beat me. Every time I went up, she beat me. And, you know, after you've been beat over 10 times, sometimes people got a tendency of quitting. And I said, no, I'm not gonna quit, I'm not gonna quit. And I kept doing it until I got where I could beat her. And what was so strange about it is I beat her, the first race that I ever beat, I barely beat her. But I think that, and that like, was, that was the springboard. You know, once I saw that I can do it, I said, uh-oh, now it's a little different. Now I'm ready. And I think that's the way the mind works. You know, sometimes you may not think you can do it. You may not think you can do it. But as long as you got that doubt, you're never going to do it. And I think that's what happened by me continuing to want to race her, continually to want to race her. You know, uh, sometimes you're going to win. You know, I use that excuse as so strange because you can take two little dogs, one could be a small dog, the other is a small puppy, but he's going to grow up to be this huge 160-pound dog. And you can take this one 30-pound little dog that is an adult at the time, and this big dog, as he grow up, he's been dominated by this little dog. So he always grows up thinking this little dog could beat him. So he can get to his full size of 160 pounds, this little dog still, you know, it's only like 30 pounds, but he still think, the big dog still think the little dog can beat him, so he's afraid of him because he don't know any better. And I said, sometimes that's the way the mind is, is if you continue continually to say you can't do it, you're not going to do it. But sooner or later, you got to make that, you know, like I said, you got to swing that bat because you never know if you're going to hit a home run. When I was in the seventh grade, I think, they have this race at the end of the school year, like a mile run. And, uh, you know, I felt that if I can win that mile run, I have all these friends, people going to come and talk to me because I won the mile. So about three weeks before the race, my father was a farmer. So he plowed this field, and I got out, went into training with my younger brother. We went out and we went into training so I could uh, get ready to win this mile. For three weeks, I trained. The final, finally, the day came to, for the race, and I, uh, I got up there with this guy, Willie Jenkins, I remember his name, and this other guy, uh, Wells, who uh, everybody predicted they were going to win the race. They were the most athletic kids in my class. And I got up there right with them to run this race, and we started running. And I was feeling good. I was feeling great. I was in shape. No one knew I was been, I'd been uh, training except my younger brother. So we were running around the track, and about the second lap, something said, Herschel, you're not going to win. I'm running, and I'm thinking, OK, wait a minute. Third lap, something said, Herschel, you're not going to win. 
and I'm, I'm up front. There's only like, I'm in the second place. I'm right up front, I'm feeling good. I'm not even tired. And going into the last lap, so I'm saying, Hershey, you're not gonna win. You're not gonna win this race. You better get out of it, you better get out of it. So right on the bike, bike side of the, the finish line, I started thinking, oh geez, I'm not gonna win. So how can I get out of this race without embarrassing myself? And I'm like in second, whereas I probably could have won it if I had kept running. And uh, I said, okay, what am I gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna pretend like I pulled a muscle. So on the last curve, I walked off the field and grabbed my hamstring as at a, in the seventh grade and pretend like I hurt my leg. And uh, Willie Jenkins ended up winning his race and all day it bothered me. And when I remember going home, getting off the school bus, my younger brother ran up to me and said, how did it, how did it go, how did it go? And I, and I said, well, I, I hurt my leg. And I lied about it. And he said, oh, you know, you'll get them next time. You know, and that made me feel so bad because, uh, you know, you don't, I lied and then, you know, and I think the thing is I didn't try. And I said then no matter whatever happened in my life from then on, I don't care what happened, I'm gonna give everything I got. And it's funny because, you know, I see so many people today that, that don't wanna try. And I say, I don't care what I ever do. I never give up at, at anything anymore. I don't care what it is. You'll never see me give up. Oh, jeez. I can't believe it. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, I think people, it's so funny because uh, people think I'm crazy because I do so many crazy things, but I think because of that race in my life, you know, I'm, I'm what you call the renegade of uh, professional sports. You know, I've done everything. I've done bobsled, karate, dance, to just about anything. Now, I'm not gonna say I'm the best at it, but I guarantee you I give most people to run for their money at just about everything. Being an athlete is being a competitor, not on the football field, but in life. And you gotta be able to compete in the classroom because you can always be president when you're 60, but when you turn 30, they're gonna say you're too old for football. So knowledge can take you a long ways. Being an athlete can only take you a short little sprint. And you wanna study hard because you always got something. Like I said, it is so great to be able to understand, you know, something. To sit down with the president and understand what's happening, and then to go sit out there on the street with anyone, still understand. That is, that is beautiful to do that. Just to go out and run a touchdown is only great for that time. The next week, if you don't do it, they don't want you around no more. The hardest thing I, I think I had to overcome in life, uh, I think racism. Yeah, I think that's so difficult because I don't think anyone can ever understand it. And, and it's not the point that people don't want to understand it, but they, they don't want to touch it. So like, that's a subject we can't touch, let's get away from it. But you know, it's there, and as long as it's there, you gotta cope with it. So with me, I'm always the type of person, if something is in front of me, let me deal with it. Let's not push it under the rug or push it to the side because no matter what, it's gonna keep coming up. You know, if you never deal with that dirt up under the carpet, it's gonna get larger and larger, and it's gonna keep coming up. You know, little bit by little, it's gonna seep from underneath that carpet. So you deal with it now, you know, and you're gonna try to get those piles out. I think that's been the most difficult thing. I grew up in the South. Uh, my senior year was a very big uh, racial uh, detention. You know, in my hometown, that was a very big deal. And, you know, it's, it's tough, but you knowing who you are and you knowing that, you know, whites know better than you are, Herschel. You're no better than they are. And I think the biggest thing that helped me to overcome is when it's all said and done, God is not going to have a list and say, oh, geez, you're white, so you're going in, you're black, you're not, or you're black, you're coming in, and you're white, you're not. You know, God don't care. And, you know, my mother once told me, and uh, I know this is almost similar to it, is I was going to church one Sunday, and I didn't want to go. I was tired of going to church and stuff, and I hid my shoes. I didn't want to go. And... Uh, 
It's funny because uh, I went to my mother and she said, oh, you ready to go to church? And I said, no, I, I can't go. She said, why? I said, you know, I don't have any shoes. You know, you only have one pair of Sunday sh shoes. And I said, I don't have any shoes to go. And she said, no, you can come on and go. I said, I don't have any shoes. She said, you know, God don't care how you look. And I thought about it. And, you know, that's true. God don't care how you look. And that's what he don't care whether you're white, black, pink. As long as you've been a good person, you believe in him. And I said, that's the key. And we always... I think we're, we're always putting category. We got to put someone in a category. Okay, he's this, he's that, he's this. You know, and that's that doesn't matter, as long as he can do the job. You know, I think that's what counts. Oh, it takes a lot of hard work. I'm talking mentally, mentally, physically. It takes a lot of hard work, and I say you just got to dedicate yourself. And it, it's so it's so strange, and and uh, I think that's why I, that's why I don't I never let anyone read my poetry. Or I never let anyone see it because I they I don't think they can ever understand it. And and you know when I speak about this here, people think I'm absolutely crazy. But I I say you know sometimes mentally I I can get so I don't drink. I never tasted alcohol. I don't smoke. I never do any of that. But I can get so high of my belief and my will that it's almost like you're invincible. You know, I'm so high of God that I don't care what you do to me, you can never destroy me. Well, coming from a small town, it's, uh, it was tough really to dream big. You know, my biggest dream, you know, I grew up in a small town in Georgia. My biggest dream was one day to be able to go to Atlanta, Georgia. You know, to be able to go to Atlanta, which was, which Atlanta was uh, about two hours, four to five minutes from my home. So, you know, the dream about going to Atlanta was it. You know, and you think about that, you think about that, and you know, I I never dreamed about football. I never dreamed about being an actor because you know that was out of reach. Coming from a small town that was big in farming, farming, and uh, also big in uh, clothing factories. You know, you don't dream about being a professional football player or a, uh, you know, an actor. So you go to Atlanta and you're in the big city now. You know, you're there and, and that was that was the dream. You know, and uh, the majority of the people that I uh, looked up to, not looked up to, I hate that, I don't like that word, but the majority of the people that I was growing up with were going off into the military. So a lot of my classmates you know, thought of uh, going into the military. That was something more worthwhile. They thought that was, uh, that had a purpose. And, you know, I was more of a kid that was always by himself. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't drink. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big partier, so I love being by myself. So by seeing that, then taking everything in, like putting it deep down inside, inside me, I realized then that, you know, the military has got a purpose. And, you know, that's when I uh, just said I wanted to go into the military at that time. I think growing up in that small town has given me a lot of values. Uh, it has helped me to mature as an individual as well as a person. I think as an individual because it helped me to have confidence within myself. I think today what we have to help our youth to uh, gain is confidence within themselves. You know, people use so many excuses. Peer pressure is their biggest excuse. There's no such thing as peer pressure. If you believe within yourself, there's no peer pressure because you believe what's right and what's wrong. And I think every individual know what's right. You know, you can take your, your most violent criminal and you ever talk with him and he would say, I wanted to get caught because I knew what I was doing wasn't right, but I couldn't stop. So I said, there's no peer pressure if you believe within yourself. So with me, I think growing up, I started developing confidence in what I felt. My parents helped me to believe in myself. I wasn't the best looking guy. I was not the best athlete in the world, but they made me feel good about myself. Herschel, you are somebody. You know, whether you're black, white, doesn't matter. You are a person and God, lo and God loves you. So that made me feel good. So I was able to feel good about myself growing up in a small town. And then it gave me those real hard work ethics. You know, that's what we, use, we need today. Young people, adults, we need good work ethics because nothing is going to come to you easy. We got too much of a competitive world for anything to come easy to you. 
people competing in everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Football, that's just athletics. But in the business world, you know, doing everything, people are competing. So you got to get those very good work, work ethics. And I think that helped me that develop good work ethics in a small town. I was a little different. I still say I'm a little different because I, my dreams are, you know, success to me is not having the most money or having the biggest car or the biggest house. Success is just being happy. And I try so many different things. I do a lot of different things because I, I think God has helped me to love myself. And God, I know who God is, and I love God. So I think growing up as a kid, you know, I, I used to write all the time. I was always by myself. And it's not that I wanted to be by myself, but we lived in a small town. We lived out in the country. There was no one around, so I was not going to use excuses and, and you know, one or away, away from home, go over someone else. I sit at home. I wrote uh, whatever I can get my hands on. I read. And, you know, I... Uh, I just was a different little kid, I think. I tell you, my favorite subject probably was math. I, I love math. Uh, I uh, I don't know. I think figures just in, intrigued me, and I used and I was very good at math. English probably was my worst subject, but I used to write a lot of poetry. I used to write poetry all the time, and. Uh, it's a little different because, uh, you know, I just can't sit down and write. And it's something that just came to me. And a lot of people say, Hershey, you may be writing because you're depressed. Are you writing this? And I said, no, because I, I write happy things. You know, I write happy things. I, I write, you know, from uh, love to uh, death. Write about space. And, you know, I said, just something that I, I'm thinking at the time and not anything that I think I can think of right now if I had to come up with just something that, that, that came to me. I think growing up in that small town, I, I thought knowledge, and I still think today knowledge is one of the key because when you're able to understand, life is a lot more beautiful then. When you're able to uh, hear another language and understand it, it's a little bit beautiful than just hearing it. When you're able to see a uh, painting up on the wall and understand what you're looking at, it's a little bit more beautiful. And and I, so I used to like just read anything. I remember uh, getting a Sears catalog and reading about how this was done and wearing stuff and just thinking, you know, I don't know how in the why in the world I'm reading about women dresses, how to make women dresses. I don't think I'm ever going to become that. But you know, just reading things, you know, I was just intrigued by. It. I used to read the Bible a lot, read little short Bible stories. And uh, in today's, uh, whenever I give speeches, I bring up a few of those Bible stories because those are inspirations to me. The reason why, you know, you have some people get up and they tell you their life story, how they are uh, sort of like a boxer always uh, comes out and he said, well, I was never a tough guy and this guy stole my bike like the Muhammad Ali. So I went into boxing and next thing you know, I'm the heavyweight champion. You know, anyone could do that. I don't mean anyone can do it, but anyone can do like one of those stories. But no one can die and come back alive again. You know, you, it hasn't been done yet. There's only one person that has, has done something like that. So that inspired me. I said, hey, this guy's my hero. If he can do that, you know, I'm going to believe in this guy here. And to see him <clears throat> who can help the blind to see, you know, people that are sick, he can cure them. So he became a guy that I looked up to. So I used to read anything, and whenever my parents or anyone started talking about, you know, religion or about God, you know, I, you know, I ease over there and listen a little bit because I said, that's knowledge. And, you know, I'm not a big guy that's going to try to throw religion on anyone because that person has to be accountable for himself. And I think that's what we have to do in a society today is to be accountable for yourself. I think we have the tendency of always want to live, in, want to live someone else's life. We want to tell that person what to do, how to act, but yet we don't know how to act. And I think first, if we learn to act, Maybe we can help that other person. And, you know, I think that's the way I try to be brought up. I never really had a favorite poet, and I never really uh, had a favorite poem, for per se, 
rather than uh, it's not a poem, but something I read when when it's about uh, you know the footprints in the sand, and you know, and that is stuck in my mind so much because you know I think about it with friends, you know, where God is walking along with you in the sand, and uh, and all of a sudden there's one set of footprints when you look back, and times are hard, and you ask God, you say, God, you know, when things were going well, you know, I look back, there was two sets of footprints in the sand, and now that uh, things are a little bit tougher, you've left me. You know, why? And God said, you know, it's not that uh, I've left you, it's just that I'm carrying you, and, and that stuck in my mind because it is so strange how we sometimes just forget. And I think growing up, I think that's today is what keep making me drive forward. It's just thinking about the people in my hometown, you know, that encouraged me and the people that uh, stood behind me, that helped me. And, you know, I said, I'm not going to forget those people because they knew me before anything. They knew me before anything, and they were, they were right there with me. You know, no matter what, they were right there, and they were cheering me on. And, you know, they didn't care whether uh, Herschel won that 100-yard dash, but as long as Herschel went out and competed hard, they were proud of me. I was sort of embarrassed because I say, you know, coming from a small town and this and that, and I'm seeing all these kids from all over the country and, you know, seeing what they've done. And, you know, they had a few whiz kids here that was in college. And, you know, it just, it, it made me proud just to be a part of it. I don't care if I was riding on the coattails as I felt then. It just made me proud to be a part of it, where it inspired me and said, Herschel, you know, you can get better. You know, why don't you get a little bit better? Because, you know, the academy means something. The academy of achievement, you know, that's always that means something. And it just made me real proud when I, you know, and I came up as a student, you know, it was like, man, all these other kids here and, you know, and, you know, and I think as an individual, sometimes you think I'm the only one that's from a town that's so small, you know, you can, you know, if everyone breathes at the same time, you may run out of oxygen. You know, there's nothing there. So it, it's, it's so strange where I came up to this, this place that has so many students, like, that, that knew everything. You know, you, you're thinking, shoot, I, I, I thought I knew everything. You know, I thought my mother and father knew everything. Here, here's this little kid here that, you know, he knows about trying to, uh, trying to put together this spear that can st tell you when the speed of light, how fast the speed of light, and this and that. You know, that, that was uh, stunning to me. That was stunning. My parents, uh, growing up, they worked hard. You know, everyone in my family, we up early in the morning. I used to see my mother and father go off to work and come back, and no matter what, they had time, you know, for the kids. They disciplined us to do what was right. You know, you knew what to do, you knew not you knew not what to do. You knew what to do and you knew what not to do. And they whenever a child in the house, a kid in the house went off to work, my parents made him be sure of himself that when he went he was gonna work. He was not going there to clown around, he was not going there just to pass time away. He was going to work. And he was not gonna just try to make a dollar by sitting down. He was going to give everything he's got. And I think because of that, that's why I'm always going to give everything I got, because God is going to be proud of you then. You know, there's no such word in my family as lazy, and because that's, that's no such thing. And I think, like, lazy and I quit is a bad word in the vocabulary. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You know, you never know. God is number one, uh, my parents, my wife, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, I don't have a lot of friends because I'm always moving around. I don't have a lot of friends. I don't drink, so I don't hang out in bars, but, you know, they've been very, uh, very big in my life because they've helped encourage me, you know, when things get so tough, you know, sometimes uh, things get so tough and all of a sudden you see people start easing away from you then. Hey, they, they, they said to themselves, hey, I got problems, and I don't need to hear his problems, so I'm going to ease away. But no matter what, you know, I can call my parents at any time of the night. You know, I'm in Europe sometime, and, uh, you know, that's such a big time difference. 
And I remember then uh, calling my mother, but it was about three in the morning. And I just wanted to talk, and she was so happy for me to call. You know, she's waking up, she's so happy for me to call. And that sort of put, bring tears to your eyes, because, you know, sometimes I think a, a boy grew up in his family not able to say I love you and stuff. And uh, over the last uh, year or so, I was, first time I ever told my parents that. And uh, it's so weird because I say you grow up and you, you don't even say it, and the word is such a full letter, short little word, and you, you, know, you just can't even say I love you. And I started saying it, and it, it becomes so easy now. It's, if I don't say it when I hang up the phone, I have to call right back and say, oh, I forgot to say I love you all and stuff. You know, and it, it's so funny where now it comes so easy, and I say, you know, we are, we're sometimes so macho we forget who we are. And, you know, that's something I'm not going to do. I love to work. I love to learn new things. I love to see a lot of new things. But I'm not a person that's going to try to impress anyone because I think as long as I'm myself, you, know, you either like me or you don't, but, you know, I can't help that. There's nothing else I can do. I didn't have uh, role models like football players in my life when I was growing up. You know, I never thought that, uh, you know, I never thought you can be a football player, so I never watched it you know, as a uh, little kid. But what I did see was my mother and father getting up early in the morning, going to work, and coming back late in the afternoon. And that they never complained about it. And what I did see is see my mother saying, you know, I love God, and my father loving God. And so they put that love on me, and they threw all that on me to love God. And so my, my role models in life have been my parents, because they never complained about anything they ever done. That was seven kids. You know, my father is, is so strange because my father had six sisters. He was the only boy. And when he was 12, his father was killed. So he took the responsibility to raise his six sisters. Never complained, never said anything about it. And I say, you know, that's my role model in life. And it's strange because I never said anything to him about it. And uh, I was in Innsbruck, Austria one, one time, you know, a long way away from home. And, I started thinking, I said, you know, I always tell my mother I love her, but I never told my father that. And I said, you know, it's so funny because uh, he means so much to me in my life, and I just never say that. I happened to call him up. It took me a couple of days to get him because of the time difference. But when I called him up, I, uh, I told him. My mother said, you don't know what that really meant to him. And those are people that I look up to in life that have given me this, and I think, if I go out in life now and do something crazy, I embarrass them. I don't care about embarrassing myself. I don't, I don't care about embarrassing myself, but to embarrass people that I love or to embarrass people that I've drawn so much from, I think it destroy me worse than anything. I think uh, dedication, hard work, whereas I, uh, I wanted to be an athlete because at that time, uh, being an athlete was considered cool. You know, I was not cool. I was not the uh, prince of the school or, you know, Mr. Uh, big Man on Campus and all that. And I just wanted to be acknowledged. I wanted people to, you know, come up to me sometimes and say, hey, Hersh, how you doing, rather than laughing at me because I couldn't talk and all this. And uh, so I just started training myself. You know, we didn't have weights. We didn't have a lot of money. but. You know, if I can get in a little book on uh, the human body, I read about it, and I just started training myself. And uh, I loved the way I felt. You know, I felt good about myself, and I, I love that. That motivated me, not just in sports, but it motivated me in the classroom. You know, just, you know, it just made me feel good. I never knew what the Heisman Trophy was. I was in. I was a freshman. I was nominated for for one of the first freshmen ever to be nominated for the Heisman. My sophomore year, this year, I said I should have won it. My junior year, I ended up winning. I never knew what the Heisman Trophy was. I knew it meant something big, but I never really knew. And I won, and it meant that I was the best college athlete. But I was ashamed because then you had so many good athletes out there, and for me to be singing out, I was sort of ashamed. But yet, after I won the award, I said, "Now this is going to be an inspiration for me to stand up." for all the guys that didn't get a chance to win it, continue to go out there and work hard so they can say, you know, that's the guy that won it. He took it from me, and he deserved it.
You know, I don't then say, okay, he won it, but I should have got it because look what I'm doing now. You know, and I think it's an inspiration for me. You know, that's a good question because I don't think I, I knew that to the last minute until I was on a professional field playing a game. It's about the first time I ever knew that I was going to be paid to play football. You know, when I grew up, I didn't think you'd get paid to play football. Who's going to pay you to play football? And when I went to college, I went to college to really get my criminal justice degree. I wanted to be in the FBI. You know, my dream, you know, as a little kid, kids dream to be a fireman, a policeman, and as they turn 15, they forget about that dream. Ever since I was a little boy, I wanted to be in the FBI. So as I grew up, that's, that was my dream. That's all I wanted to do. And when I got a chance to go to college, I was going to my criminal justice degree and I wanted to go to law school and go into the FBI. I was playing football and I never really thought it was going to be a reality until my first day I was out on the football field and I realized then that I was going to play football and not have a chance to really go into the FBI until late in my career. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't uh, regret it. I think it, it's been a, a blessing for me. I was excited because I got better. I think that's where you get, you get better. And uh, for me, I learned more, and that's the reason it's exciting for me. As long as I can mature mentally, it's a little bit more exciting for me. I want to learn more. And going into the professional, going into professional football, you help me to play guys that were a little bit, been there a little bit longer, where it's Hershey. You can be the fastest guy, you can be one of the strongest guys, but you're not going to be better until you're a little bit wiser. And I, I learned that. I learned like different ways to do things and it was a lot easier. Didn't take as much strength and as much speed. Just took knowledge. And you know, I, I had that open mind to listen. I'm learning every day. I think when it get to the point where I'm not learning or where I'm just pushing myself, uh, I'm giving it up. Because then I think I'm not gonna perform well. You know, I'm just gonna be there. And I don't wanna just be there at nothing. I don't just wanna just show up if you're not going to show up and uh, dance at the party, don't go. It's called a party, so you got to have fun. And because I don't drink, I reckon I got to dance. Uh, for me, it's exciting. You know, I, I, uh, I'm, I don't get nervous. I don't knock on wood. This is so weird. I don't get nervous before a game. I get excited because this is an opportunity for me to go out there and show what the Lord has done for me. I'm so excited because the Lord has given me this ability. I'm so excited just to go out there, you know, to put on those shoulder pads, put that helmet on, and then go out there and go with it. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's funny because it's like, it's not in my nature. I'm more of a low key, you know, but when I get ready to perform, I don't care if there's no one in the stands. I want to go out there and play because I'm ready to go out there and, you know, to, to get better. And, you know, it's, it's like a high, you know, when you're running the ball sometimes, you know, you don't even feel, you can't even see behind you, but you can feel a person there. You know, it's so wild where you can just feel things, you don't even have to see it. You know, you get the ball and, like, everything opens up for you. You can tell where everyone is, everyone is at it. Everything is, it's like everything is so slow, but yet you see it on film, it happens so quick. You know, you can tell, like, how many cleats this guy had on his shoes, but yet, like, it's so quick, you don't know how anymore you count it. You can see this guy coming to tackle, you can see his eyes. You can almost, you have time to even say what he's thinking. Sometimes the guy is saying, hey, oh, geez, how am I going to tackle this guy? Whether I'm going to hit him at the legs or whether I'm trying to jump on him and hold him until this. You can see all this, but yet you see it on film, and it happens so quick. So it's like a real big high for me. No, I never really asked uh, because I I hope that the quarterback know that uh, I want the ball. I think when he look in my eyes, he can see that I want the ball. And I'm not being selfish, but I want to play. You know, if, it, if the clock is winding out and we're behind, and you know, I want the ball. I think he can look in my eyes and say, "Hey, Herschel want the ball. Let me see can I get it to him." And uh, you know, I, I think some guys all of them want the ball. If you're a professional, you want the ball. And, you know, that's, that's the type of team I want to be with. I want to be with guys that's not afraid to take that last shot. You have a lot of guys that are afraid to lose it. But if you're afraid to lose, you're never going to win.
Yes, that's a part of the game. It's a part of the game to go out and carry the ball. It's a part of the game to go out and catch the ball. And I say, you know, you are becomes mentally weak when you're saying, I'm too tired to go on. You know, I've trained all week. How can I be tired? So I say, you can't get tired. It's not time to get tired. We don't have enough time for you to get tired. You can get tired tomorrow. That's important. Teamwork is very important. You know, uh, football, basketball, baseball, very important because you're as strong as your weakest link. I never knew what that meant until uh, I know mentally what it means because there's 45 guys on the team, and I made a statement to my teammates that if there's one guy that don't believe in we can win, I don't want to play with him because I don't want your negative influence over the other 44. I don't want a negative atmosphere around me. You know, I want something positive. I don't care if we're losing, but I want something positive. I want you to believe we can win. Because once it happens, it's going to happen. It's going to happen big. And I don't want no one that's going to be uh, that you have to carry. Because sooner or later, you're going to get heavy. You know, I can carry you a little ways, but sooner or later, you got to stand up and say, I got to carry myself the rest of the way. You're running a business, you got employees, and you got one that don't want to do anything but goof off the other one are working hard and they're carrying him. Sooner or later, he's going to get heavy. And he's got to stand up or she's got to stand up and be accounted for. And if they can't do that, you know, you don't need them around. You know, and you hate to say you fired them, but you got to make a change. And, you know, and they, seem, they may not understand it, but that's the way life is. Hey, this is a business. This is a football team. You know, if you want it to be something else, you're in the wrong line of business. I never read an article about myself. Since I've been growing up, I've never read anything about myself. I'm not a big sports page reader. I don't read sports pages. One reason why is I don't read about myself because I know myself better than the person that's writing the article. I don't read a lot of the sports because I think people sometimes either build it up or you have this guy that hates sports who's going to write bad about it, so I figured I'm not going to read it because I'm not going to let him uh, put a idea into my head. And I think reporters do not realize that they do that. And, you know, they would continue to say we're giving the news, but you put an idea in someone's head. They take an athlete, they build this athlete up, the kids look up to him, they're making the best thing in the world, and this athlete make one mistake. They write bad about him, saying he's a bum, he's this, he's that. Then on the next day, they build him back up again. So a kid may get that idea and say, hey, I can do that. I can be great, I can be great, and all of a sudden I can make a mistake, and I'm going to go down and I'm coming right back up. That's not the way life is. And I think when you're writing an article, you got to, I feel, you got to put what's true. You can't, you can't just you know, build it up. You know, if you want to write for the National Enquirer, you do that. But if, I think if you want to write for the people, you must write, you know, the pen. You got to use the pen the correct way. So I, that's the reason why I don't read a lot of sports stuff. Of all the things I've ever done, uh, I think getting married. And the reason I say that is, you know, I was a person that was always by myself a lot. I always rode, you know, and I think getting married gave me a uh, best friend, you know, and it gave me a person that, you know, she may not know all her show, but she knows me better than anyone else. You know, she's like, you, know, you always say you want to marry someone like your mother. And I'm going to say my wife's like my mother, but... You know, my mother knows me, but then my mother says she don't know me. Whereas my wife says she knows me, and then she says she don't. But it gave me a best friend, you know, someone that, you know, I can laugh and, you know, I can act silly sometime, and they're not going to judge me on that act. You know, I think people sometimes judge you, you know, but you have a right to be uh, free for a little bit. You have a right just to uh, laugh and, you know, just just to act up, as long as it's not in a, in a bad way. You can't satisfy everybody. You know, growing up, I knew you can never satisfy everybody, so I'm not going to try to satisfy everybody. I'm going to go out and do the very best athletically on the field as I can for my teammates, my friends, my, you know, for me. But, you know, if someone don't like it, I can't do anything else, you know, and. 
I say, you know, everyone, we try to satisfy everybody. You can't satisfy everybody. That's tough. That's tough to do. And if you do it once, you're going to be doing it all your life. And I think I started out early not doing it. And I think today I'm able to, uh, you know, when I hear the criticism, I'm able to let it run off my back. Because I said someone that is criticizing, I'm not doing what they're supposed to do. You know, if we're running a race and he's thinking about, oh, geez, Hershey's running with his knee not in the correct way. Sooner or later, Hershey's going to be easing up in front of him because he's not concentrating on what he's supposed to do. And I say, you know, uh, not speaking of uh, what the movie critics, but it's so funny because uh, they criticize so many movies, but yet a lot of the movies they criticize I like. So I said, what is so strange about it is who said that they're the people who decide to move it? And I, that's the way I look at life. Well, I don't feel a big responsibility. The reason why, I, I think we, as an adult, we all are role models. If a little kid see an adult doing something, he's thinking that it's okay. And for myself, I don't feel responsibility. The reason why is I think no matter what, I'm going to do the very best I can, I can do. I'm going to be the very best I can be. Because I think if a kid can see me doing that, he's going to want to be the best he can be. But that's the way I am. I think we all should be like that. I, and it's so strange because I say a role model, what is that? Something to inspire you to do better? But I think if we all do better, it'll make this world better. So I don't think it's a responsibility because I think if I didn't do that, I'm cheating myself. And if I can be the best I can be, I'm helping someone else out anyway. I love to be in the FBI. The FBI has always been a dream, even though I don't think I get a chance to do it. I've spent a few weeks in Quantico, Virginia at the FBI Training Center, and while I'm in Dallas, Texas now, I may go out with the uh, FBI there and do a few things, and I really enjoy that. You know, I think that's a lot of fun, and, you know, I love that. I'm on the U.S. bobsledding team, so I, you know, I do different things with that. I'm very big in martial arts. I love martial arts. Uh, I say I want to get into a movie with Chuck Norris and do uh, some martial arts movies. And, um, you know, I dance with the ballet. So I, I do a lot of things because, you know, I think that's what you got to do. You know, life is almost like a tree for a 15-year-old where he don't know where he's going to branch off to. But if he try to stay at this one thing, you know, he's never going to blossom. And the reason why, because you don't know your talent. I never thought I was going to be a football player, but now I'm a football player, and being a football player, I was able to go into the business world and do well. I was able to do this. I was able to do that. But yet, I think if I had said, okay, Hersh, you're a basketball player, stay with basketball. You know, I never would have done anything because, I, you know, I'm not. I can play, but I'm not a professional basketball player. So I, I think when you're young, sometimes you got to have an open mind to take on other challenges. You know, you may get into it and you may like it a little bit more than you think. My most exciting achievement is being on the Olympic team in bobsledding. Uh, and one reason I say that is because, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of controversy going on whether I should have the chance to compete on the Olympic team and this and that. And I say, you know, my problem with that is when you try for an Olympic team, I think they want, they ask for the very best the United States has to offer. And if there's guys that's been practicing for years and cannot beat me who's only been practicing for a few weeks, they do not deserve to be on the team. And to have an opportunity to go and become the best pusher for the U.S., I think was my biggest accomplishment. And then I think dancing in the Fort Worth Ballet. Uh, you know, ballet is probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And when I was asked to uh, dance in the Fort Worth Ballet, I first declined. And then they asked me to come to the first rehearsal. So I went, and uh, after being with professionals, I said I better de decline because that's no way I could do it. And I stayed with it, and I finally performed with them. And you know, and. People always say, why you never said the Heisman Trophy? Well, I never said the Heisman Trophy because uh, 
you know, as a freshman, they said Herschel should have won the Heisman Trophy. As a sophomore, they said Herschel should have won the Heisman Trophy. As a junior, Herschel wins the Heisman Trophy. And I said Herschel in third person because that's what people say about me all the time. But uh, I feel my junior year, did I win the Heisman Trophy or did, did they give it to me because they say he should have won it this year, he should have won it that year, so let's give it to him now. Even though I had a good year, but, you know, I, uh, I don't know whether I won it because I deserved it, which, you know, I could have, or did I win it because they gave it to me. So I never said I had some trophy, and people get upset about me about it, but, you know, uh, I'd say I must tell the truth. My mother's going to get upset with me. I think winning the national championship as a freshman. You know, I was a starter on a freshman team that ended up winning the national championship on a team that no one picked to do anything. This It was funny because we were not picked, and I watched uh, from the year, and I uh, I was on the cover of Sports Illustrated once, and they had, like, the college team listed. University of Georgia was, like, number 16. So I have another one where the University of Georgia is number 11. Then I have another one where the University of Georgia is number one. So I, people never picked us to do anything. And all of a sudden, we ended up winning the national championship. And people just, that was amazing. And what that taught me was that it doesn't matter what people think about you. Absolutely, it do not matter what people think about you. What matters is what you think about yourself. Because we're, everybody on that team felt that we were the best team in college football. No one else outside that team felt that. But we all felt that way. So I learned then what matters most is what you feel about yourself, not what someone else feels about you. Everything should be looked at in a positive way. Whether it was something bad that happened in your life, but it helped you to get better. And you know, sometimes your parents say, don't touch that, it's hot. But if you never touch it, you're never gonna know. So even though that was a negative response, but it's made a positive response in your mind because now you know not to touch it anymore. So mistakes should be taken as a training tool to help you to get better. I lost a brother and I was so mad at God, I was mad at everyone, but that yet that helped me to understand God a little bit more because God is never gonna give me a burden I can't handle. And yet I was being selfish. Herschel, you're being selfish. You know, God is gonna take care of your brother better than you could have done if he was here. And I was being selfish, so that negative response came out to be positive because now I know God a little bit more. I know that Herschel, you were selfish. So now I know how to react and let's go around. I think believing in yourself, being able to lay your head on your pillow at night and rest in peace, meaning you've given it your all, you know, you've given everything you got to give, not worrying. You got to believe that what you're doing is right. You know, because, you know, there are some people know what they're doing is wrong. They believe it so much, they still do it. So you got to believe what you are doing is correct. You got to believe in yourself. You have so many people that pray, but yet they don't do anything. Sort of like you can't win a lottery unless you buy a ticket. You can't hit a home run unless you take a swing at the ball. So you got to be willing to work at it and believe in yourself. I think the most important thing is to, uh, like I said, believe in yourself, be willing to take chances, be willing to work harder than your fellow man. Because in professional football, maybe only 2%, if that many, of professional, of college guys coming out of college make a professional football team, and maybe even less of a percent of basketball players. So the chances that you make it is very tough. So you gotta believe in yourself and work a little bit harder because the guy right behind you is watching what you do and he's trying to work hard. And through hard work, good things you can accomplish. But you know, it was, I always say education is so important because you can be president at 60. As a professional football player, they're gonna say you're old at 32. They're trying to get rid of you then. But you can be president at 60 and plus, athletes must realize in college, we are starting out in high school because they need the foundation. I think high school are not giving athletes the foundation 
to even prepare themselves for college. And when they get to college, they're not prepared for professional football. And the reason why is they have no study habits. A football player do not just go play the game. You must become a student of the game. You know, they give you a playbook with uh, 500 pages in training camp and say, learn this. Most guys can't learn it. Most guys do not make it. So they must have good study habits. And you get that through, you know, paying attention in school. That, it's, it's funny. I, uh, I'm never, I never said I was smart. I, I, you know, I, I was valedictorian because I just paid attention. You know, I went to school, I sit there, and I just shut my mouth, and I wrote down things, and, and that was it. That's all you got to do is go to class. College, uh, I hate to say athlete, because a lot of college students just don't go to class to that exam, then they go and they try to cram. But you just go and pay attention. You know, somebody once said, it's best for them to think that you're stupid by you saying nothing than you to open your mouth and they know you're stupid. Believe in yourself. Just strive to be the very best you can be. Run the race against yourself and not the guy in the other lane. And the reason I say that is as long as you give it 110%, you're going to succeed. But as long as you're trying to beat the guy over there, you're worried about him. You're not worrying about how you're going to perform. But believe in yourself because I think that's the very big key and to work hard. To dream, it takes work. To have a nightmare, takes nothing. And I think if you're going to dream, you got to be willing to work because then it can be possible. If you're going to have a nightmare, you don't have to do anything but just hide in the closet. And I, I, I said dreams are possible through a lot of hard work. You know, and I know I talk a lot, but it's funny because people pray sometimes. It's, it, people will pray and yet they're going to sit there with their hands out hoping God is going to drop money in their hands. But that, it doesn't work like that. If you're going to pray, you got to get out and do something. You can't just sit in the bed. So that's, you know, that's what is so strange. If you're going to pray, you got to make an effort. And you know, I, I, that's the way it is. If you're going to dream, you got to make an effort to get out and do something.